dinosaur bone, biofilm, and carbon-14. There's an article in The Scientist, um, which is a kind of a news article, uh, entitled Fossil, uh, Fossilized Dino Bones Are Home to Diverse Microbial Communities. And they're sort of uh, quasi-abstract, says a study fails to detect ancient proteins among the microbes, adding to the debate about whether peptides can survive tens of millions of years underground. And uh, it's fairly recent. Um, fossilized dinosaur bones host a diverse community of microbes, but probably not ancient proteins, according to a study published last week, June 18, in eLife. The work, based on analysis of Cretaceous age samples, supports the ideas of fossilized bones as open systems that interact with the sediment around them and adds fuel to an ongoing debate about how long proteins and other biomolecules can resist degradation. It confirmed what I thought, said David Martell, a paleobiologist at the University of Portsmouth, who was not involved in the study. Bones are such porous things. They're not a barrier to bacteria or fungi or any other microscopic organism. They're open to being invaded. Some of the most widely publicized reports of ancient proteins have been based on samples that are tens of millions of years old. Over 65 million years to be precise, the lab of North Carolina State University paleontologist Mary Schweitzer, for example, has published uh, multiple papers describing the presence of soft tissue and proteins in pieces of bone from Tyrannosaurus rex and other dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period. While some researchers have praised the work, a number of paleobiologists who study the chemistry of protein degradation have questioned the claims, arguing that even in conditions that favor preservation, peptides can't survive intact in bone more than a few million years, like three or four. These researchers have reinterpreted putative soft tissues and ancient proteins as biofilms made by invading microbes or the result of recent contamination in the lab or field. Well, what else can they be? They can't be original because original is too old, right? Right? To investigate whether Cretaceous bone might indeed preserve ancient proteins, paleontologist Evan Saita, and we'll see his name reoccur here, who recently completed his PhD at the University of Bristol, collected fresh fossil specimens from Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. He took precautions to maintain an aseptic environment, he tells the scientists, such as bleaching and blowtorching the excavation tools used at the site and wrapping the samples in sterilized foil. That sounds like you're gonna culture something out of it, doesn't it? Labs at Princeton University and Bristol then ran a barrage of tests on the fossils and also on control samples, including mudstone from the collection site and bones from various modern animals. We used half a dozen different techniques that give us information on anything from the structure of these soft tissues in the fossilized bone to their elemental analysis to more detailed aspects of their chemistry, Cytus says. They failed to provide strong evidence or even really much evidence at all for original proteins. The team did, however, find abundant evidence of microbes. We use 16 sRNA gene sequencing to characterize the microbial community, says study uh, uh, co-author Rensing Lang, a postdoc in Tulsa Anstatt's geomicrobiology group at Princeton University. Surprisingly, we found that the DNA yield in the bone was much higher, almost 50 times higher than the adjacent mudstone. It suggests that some sort of nutrients may be able to support the growth of microorganisms in the bone. Think about that. Um, interesting that they don't report cultures. Matthew Collins, a paleoproteomics researcher at the University of Cambridge who has discussed the project with Saita and other co-authors but was not involved in the research, says he is delighted the work has been carried out. They've applied a battery of different methods and come to the conclusion that yes, there's definitely organic material in there, but the organic material they found doesn't point to being original protein from the fossil bone. What a relief. Pardon me? What a relief. Uh, yes, yes. Because otherwise we'd be in big trouble. 
Collins notes that the team's methods exclude some of the tools, such as antibodies, that are used by other groups to look for proteins in dinosaur bones. Don't use the antibodies. They could give you false positives. And they ask the question of how do you know they could give you false positives? How do you know they're giving you false positives? Here. The authors write in their paper that immunochemical methods can lead to false positive for some kind of protein. He adds that the absence of ancient proteins in one set of samples, of course, can't rule out their presence in another. So Mary Schweitzer could still be right. He hasn't actually proved that, that she's wrong. And he acknowledges it. Schweitzer, who's used antibodies along with other protein detecting techniques, tells the scientists that the new study doesn't refute what we did. She says that the protein detection methods used in the paper are less sensitive and less specific than the ones used by her team and that the presence of microbes doesn't negate the presence of endogenous biomolecules such as proteins. Think about the, pro uh, the um, uh, proposals that are being made and think about the implications of some of those proposals. Uh, skipping the rest of the uh, blurb, we'll go straight to the article itself. Cite et al. Um, uh, Cretaceous dinosaur bones and so forth in eLife. And um, this is available on the internet so you, you can read it for yourself if you want to. The abstract. Starts, fossils were thought to lack original organic molecules. And those of us who've been around for a long time remember those days. But chemical analysis showed that some can survive. Dinosaur bone has been proposed to preserve collagen, osteocytes, and blood vessels. However, proteins and labile lipids are diagenetically unstable, and bone is a porous open system allowing microbial molecular flux. These soft tissues have been reinterpreted as biofilms. Organic preservation versus contamination of dinosaur bone was examined by freshly excavating with aseptic protocols, fossils, and sedimentary matrix, and ke chemically slash biologically analyzing them. Fossil soft tissues differed from collagen chemically and structurally. While degradation would be expected, the patterns observed did not support this. 16S RNA amplicon sequencing it revealed the dinosaur bone hosted an abundant microbial community different from lesser abundant communities of surrounding sediment. Subsurface dinosaur bone is a relatively re fertile ha habitat, attracting microbes that likely utilize inorganic nutrients. How do we know that? That they put microbes in and see if they grew? Doesn't say, does it? and complicated identification of original organic material. There exists p a potential post-burial taphonomic roles for subsurface microorganisms. As we go through, ask yourself how much of this is really good work and how much of this is throwing dust in the air uh, to obscure the really important stuff. The chances of establishing a real-world Jurassic Park are slim. During the fossilization process, biological tissues degrade over millions of years with some types of molecules breaking down faster than others. However, traces of biological materials have been found inside some fossils. While some researchers believe these could be the remains of ancient proteins, blood vessels, and cells, traditionally thought to be among the least stable components of bone, others think that they have more recent sources. One hypothesis is that they are in fact biofilms formed by bacteria. To investigate, this is now the eLife Digest, which sounds like we're doing the, the abstract all over again, only maybe a little more, using a little more uh, commonly understood words. To investigate the source of the biological material in fossil bones, St. et al. performed a range of analysis on the fossilized bones of, an e of a horned dinosaur called Centrosaurus. The bones were carefully excavated in a ma manner to reduce contamination, and the sediment the bones had been embedded in was also tested for comparison. Cite et al. found no evidence of ancient dinosaur proteins. However, the fossils contained more organic carbon. Collecting this, uh, most of these appeared to have a very recent source. Sequencing the genetic material revealed that the fossils had become a habitat for an unusual community of microbes 
that is not found in the surrounding sediment or above ground. These buried microbes may have evolved unique ways of thri to thrive inside fossils. Future work could investigate how these unusual organisms live and whether the communities vary in different parts of the world. Okay, so let's look at the article itself. Fossil introduction fossils have traditionally been thought to retain little original organic material after undergoing decay and diagenesis. We were taught it had none. However, recent discoveries of relatively intact macro macromolecular organic material in fossils and subfossils challenge this view. These include ancient DNA and peptide. Uh, notice that in these references, none of them yet are uh, Schweitzer. Uh, sequences in subfossils as well as ancient biomolecules such as sterols, melanin, amino acids, and porphyrins. These are all different people. These findings show that the organic remains can potentially persist for thousands of millions of years depending on the biomolecules and the experimental conditions. Such remains have already provided important insights into evolution including the origins of our species and the affinities of extinct Pleistocene megafauna such as mammoths and elephants. In theory, millions to tens of millions of years old re organic remains could offer paleontologists new insights and a unique window into the biology of organisms distantly related to any living species. Such organic molecular fossils could potentially shed light on the biology and evolution of extinct organisms, including their coloration, structure, behavior, and phylogeny, providing unique insights into past life and the origin of, of present life. However, it main, remains unclear how long different types of organic molecules and organic structures can survive and under what condi which conditions. DNA, which is relatively unstable, is thought to persist no longer than a million years under optimal conditions. In comparison, structural proteins such as collagen are more stable, however, and are predicted to persist for longer, although how much longer is unclear. Pigments such as melanin and porphyrins are highly stable and can persist for hundreds of millions of years. And again, some references. Dinosaur bone has previously been reported to contain endogenous organic remains such as DNA, collagen, osteocytes, erythrocytes, and blood vessels. Notice that the first two are not Schweitzer. The next bunch is Schweitzer. And then the last, what, three or four of them here, and not counting the Schweitzer 2011, are not Schweitzer as well. So although Mary Schweitzer has a lion's share of this work, there are other people doing it as well. These reports have verified could change the study of uh, macroevolution and the physiology of extinct organisms, particularly considering the potential for protein sequence data to shed light on the biology and systematics of extinct organisms. Many of these, most of these reports rely on structural observations, mass spectrometry, and immunochemistry. Um, that's interesting that, uh, that uh, he's trying to group, group everything into there so that he can basically shoot at it. Uh, whereas, what are the other ones that are not the most? Subfossil and fossil vertebrae remains are primarily composed of bone, dentine, and or enamel. These represent calcified tissues with both a mineral component, primarily calcium phosphate, and a protein component that is dominated by collagen. As such, collagen is a common target in the analysis of ancient organic remains. Collagen is also non-labile relative to many other vertebrate proteins because of its decay resistance, partly due to its triple helical quaternary structure and high concentration of thermally stable amino acids, and partly because some of it's encased in bone, which protects it, and it is therefore reasonable to predict that collagen would be more resistant to microbial decay and diagenesis than many other proteins. Others have criticized reports of ancient collagen based on mass spectrometric results suggesting that they <coughs> excuse me, represent laboratory or environmental contamination or statistical artifacts. The use of antibiotics Pardon me, the use of antibodies to detect ancient collagen is also problematic since they are known to cause occasional false positives. 
and in this case they must cause completely false positives because if they're if even one of them is a true positive, then we have a problem. And have been suggested to do so in the fossil samples, and I want you to notice who wrote that. Sida et al. 2018. So uh, the guy who is the main author of this has a dog in hunt. There's no question. Furthermore, various organic and inorganic demineralization products of fossil bone that morphologically resemble blood vessels, osteocytes and erythrocytes, have alternatively been identified as biofilm or a network of microbiological materials. K et al. 2008, and that's worth reading because they didn't really have much positive to say. It's just been identified alternatively. And the question of why is not really dealt with here. Degraded and distorted organic contamination, and again, cyta et al. Or minerals such as pyrite iron oxide framboids. Although you'd expect a lot of iron and a lot of sulfur in that case, wouldn't you? Uh, especially if it's pyrite. Um, Reports of dinosaur protein and complex organic structure preservations are problematic for several reasons. Firstly, it remains unclear how such organics would be preserved for tens of millions of years. I want you to notice the major reason, the first reason, is it can't possibly be there because it's too old. If endogenous putative dinosaur soft tissues should contain diagenetically unstable proteins and phospholipids vulnerable to hydrolysis, Although the released fatty acid moieties from um, phospholipids could be stabilized through in situ polymerization into keratin-like aliphatic structures. So if endogenous, the dinosaur soft tissues could be stabilized, but it, it's kind of, you don't really expect that. At 25 degrees centigrade, pretty much room temperature, and neutral pH, peptide ha bond half-lives from uncatalyzed hydrolysis are too short to allow for Mesozoic peptide preservation. Although, uh, although the hydrolysis rates can be decreased through terminal modifications and steric effects on internal bonds. Estimates on experimental gelatinization suggest that even when frozen, Relatively intact collagen has an upper limit, age limit of only 2,700,000 years. In other words, 65 million is totally out of the question. <laughs> Secondly, so that's the first reason it can't be there. Secondly, the instances of dinosaur peptide preservation reported are older than the oldest uncontested protein preservation re reported by at least an order of magnitude. Again, it can't be there. The oldest non-controversial peptides include partially intact peptides from 3.4 million years in exceptionally cold environments, as well as short peptides bound to eggshell calcite crystals from 3.8 million years old, stabilized by unique molecular preservation mechanisms. The youngest non-avian dinosaur bones are 66 million years old. On both theoretically and empirical grounds, it seems exceptional that original proteins could persist for so long. And by the way, I agree with him in that statement. Furthermore, a long-term trend of protein loss and increasing contamination in ancient organismal remains such as bone have been shown. Fossil bones are open systems capable of organic and microbial flux. Such a system might lead not only to the loss of endogenous organics, but also to the influx of subsurface microorganisms that could complicate the, the detection of any surviving organics as well as potentially metabolizing them. The possibility of a microbiome inhabiting fossil bone is very high, especially given that decades of research have revealed the existence of a substantial deep biosphere of living microorganisms actively degrading everything organic from shallow soil organic matter to deeply buried petroleum, even in million-year-old permafrost. So bacteria everywhere. 
Since there are theoretical and empirical reasons to believe that dinosaur organics are unlikely to persist for tens of billions of years, and given the potential for contamination, we argue that the null hypothesis is that complex biomolecules, for example, nucleic acids or proteins, recovered from dinosaur bones are not original material, more likely representing recent contamination. So what they're trying to say is, we're right until you prove us wrong. We are the null hypothesis, are arguing for the null hypothesis. This hypothesis makes a series of testable predictions. One, organic material recovered from fossil dinosaur bone will differ in composition, both in chemistry and structure, from modern vertebrate proteins and tissues, beyond differences expected from norm through normal diagenesis. Two, fossils will show evidence for microbial presence, for example, through nucle nucleic acid and protein. Three, fossil bone organic material will show signatures of recent biological activity. For example, L amino acid dominance those of you who remember uh, amino acid dating will remember this. Um, or carbon-14 abundance, which would suggest the fossils are not isolated from surface processes. Here, chemical and molecular analysis are freshly collected, aseptically acquired, late Cretaceous sur surface eroded and excavated subterranean dinosaurs. All tools, for example, including all scalpel and Dremel saw, were sterilized with 10% bleach followed by 70% ethanol, then heat treated with a propane blowtorch at the site. So they're trying very hard to not introduce bacteria from the outside. Skipping over a couple of paragraphs, other controls included amino acid composition data from a reference bone, fresh modern sheep long bone, and radiocarbon data from an 82 to 71 kilo year radioactive, radiocarbon dead bovine right femur. It's, you will find out it's not really radiocarbon dead, but it's close enough that they want to call it that, uh, used as a standard from the literature. Results, light microscopy, uh, VPS uh, EM and EDS of uh, hydrochloric acid demineralized bone. The, those methods um, of demineralized uh, freeze-dried uh, dinosaur bones revealed that vessels and rare fibrous fragments uh, were white, silicon dominated with oxygen present, contained holes and were sometimes infilled with a slightly more prominent sea peak internally. This carbon, I assume. Vessels uh, occurred alongside white quartz crystals, which had strong silicon peaks and overall were elementarily similar to the vessels. And small reddish material minerals, originally presumed to be iron oxide or pyrite, but which had high silicon content with barium also present. So, um, for those of you who've read some of the other papers, you'll notice that the silicon dioxide does sometimes tend to collect along uh, blood vessels. These results show that the dinosaur bone yielded different structures when the bone appetite was removed compared to the more recent bone, that, uh, that is, primary vessels as opposed to large fibrous masses. Furthermore, the dinosaur vessels are relatively inorganic in composition compared to the more recent bone, consistent with a mineralized biofilm, but also, of course, consistent with mineralized original tissue. But uh, we're, we're, remember, we're the null hypothesis, so all we have to do is show that our hypothesis is reasonable now. Uh, ATR, FTIR of hydrochloric acid demineralized bone. Uh, skipping over the main paragraph, but the summary paragraph, these results show how, although potentially poorly resolved, 
the ATR, FDI, or peaks in dinosaur bone demineralization products could be consistent with various organic bonds present in more recent bone demineralization produ uh, products. However, note that these bonds are relatively simple and could therefore be present in various organic molecules. Furthermore, they are not necessarily ancient, endogenous, or protein-derived, but they could be. But we're not going to concentrate on that because, see, if it's a tie, we win. That's the essence of the null hypothesis. And here's some of the, this is infrared, okay? And you'll see a big spike here in chicken. You'll see a shark tooth that's been around for a while. And you can see the dinosaur bone does have uh, organic material of some kind. It looks like there's just a CH bond that's showing up. And I'm not sure that you can argue really strongly that they're different uh, enough to where you can say it isn't collagen. But you see, they've already established that if it's a tie, they win. So, and paralysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. There's a section on that. And um, then it says, the summary paragraph, these results show how the dinosaur bone lacked any clear pyrolysis products, indicative of high levels of protein preservations, and instead had a chemical composition that more closely resembles potential environmental sources. For example, mudstone matrix or humic acids than bone proteins. Here again, I'm gonna show you, remember they're saying that it's, it doesn't prove protein preservation, instead it, it's more closely resembling mudstone matrix or humic acids. Oh, did I do that? I did that. I'm sorry, I don't have, I didn't have the right one. So let me just back out of this. And I probably can't get it in this way. But let me see, I'm going to have to do it like that. Because otherwise it's just too complicated. I see it ate that. Let's do the default. And that's why. Yes. Let's see. Let me just come back to there um, and put it in the right place here. Delete. I think that will get it. Let's see. There we are. Okay. Now, I want you to notice something. Here's the humic acid, and you notice that it has a whole bunch of stuff that goes way out here. This doesn't have that suggesting it isn't humic acid primarily. This is some of the matrix, and you'll notice that it has some little bumps that go a long ways out. It could be that some of these are actually, this is gas chromatography mass spectrometry, remember, um, that, that uh, this is attenuated matrix, I suppose. Um, it does suggest that it doesn't have a lot of uh, large components, such as the chicken does, but it has a bunch of smaller components, and I'm not sure that I could say that these match that one much clo more closely than it does the chicken, but as they say, your mileage may vary. Okay, HPLC, amino acid analysis. Late Cretaceous bone tended to be L-amino acid dominated when amino acids were above detection limit. Table one. Surface eroded late Cretaceous fossil bones seem to show more variability in DL values than the subterranean bone samples. Similar to the samples described here, other non-aseptically collected room temperature stored Jurassic and Cretaceous surface eroded bones have low amino acid concentration and lack significant concentrations of D-amino acids. What is the lacking the D-amino acids mean? That um, 
that their uh, amino acid racemization date is quite low. These low levels of racemization suggest that the amino acids in the dinosaur bones are not particularly ancient. Hmm. Skipping over a little bit, radiocarbon, which of course is my favorite. Um, total organic carbon content was higher in the subterranean and surface eroded centrosaurus bone than the matrix, even the directly adjacent matrix, and was comparable to that found in the topsoil. So there's way more organic carbon inside the bone than there is in the surrounding matrix. So you don't expect a lot of travel in, but you could have some, I guess. Uh, however, the organic carbon content, uh, content in the centrosaurus bones was significantly lower than the 82 to 71 kilo a year yarn ton bovine sa uh, bone sample known to contain well-preserved radiocarbon dead collagen. Um, total organic uh, content in the centrosaurus bone was found, not found to be radiocarbon dead, but did exhibit lower uh, fraction modern carbon 14 values. Now, for what it's worth, if you've heard percent modern carbon, all you have to do is take the fraction modern carbon and multiply it by 100% and you get the uh, percent modern carbon. So if you have some of those numbers in your head, this is what you need to do to, to, to translate. Um, the, uh, ha did exhibit lower uh, values than both the mudstone and especially the topsoil. Assuming all endogenous bone carbon is radiocarbon dead, based on these um, fraction 14 values, a simple 2N member mixing model would suggest that about 26% of the carbon in subterranean centrosaurus bone originates in the adjacent mudstone matrix and um, and uh, the formulas uh, will be given elsewhere but it's relatively straightforward and here's the data itself and I want you to notice that First of all, the Yarnton bovine right femur is not radiocarbon dead. It's 0.5% modern carbon. 0.56 to be precise, which is um, actually still in the range of what they find. Um, and, the, uh, and then if you go back to the matrix, they have subtracted, you see this sample used for blank correction in the AMS analysis, therefore this value is not blank subtracted. So this is the original value. This is actually that number plus this number for the actual fraction of modern carbon. Uh, that is assuming uh, no contamination in the lab, which one probably can't completely assume. Um, but that would mean that this is actually point at two percent modern carbon and uh, if you remember the numbers from way back when um, when the paleo group were doing their dinosaur bones it ranged from about 0.6 percent to about seven percent so that's well within the normal range it's about 30,000 radiocarbon years if you believe they uh, uh, translation from fraction modern carbon to age, which nobody really does. Um, and then the, the, the adjacent mudstone is about 5%, maybe 6%. And that's why if you take uh, one of uh, three parts um, 0% and one part 5%, then you get this about this number here. Uh, topsoil is 0.76, so topsoil is pretty close to normal, but not quite zero, uh, not quite 100%. Um, mudstone on the same ridge, uh, and quite a bit higher. Apparently, the mudstone is pretty consistent, going from 5.7% uh, to 6.28% modern carbon. 
And interestingly, the surface eroded late Cretaceous bone on the same ridge is now a 4%, so this one is quite a bit lower than, than the surface eroded bone. Um, and again, the Yarnton bovine right femur is listed as, zero, as, as their blank, but obviously their blank has radiocarbon in it. The fossil dinosaur bone therefore yielded a total organic content similar to relatively rich environmental carbon sources such as topsoil, but not as high as more recent bone proteins. Although some of the carbon in the fossil dinosaur bone is potentially ancient, there is still a sizable contribution of recent carbon from the immediate environment consistent with the presence of a microbiome. Or is it? If you have a microbiome that starts eating inside the bone, it is rapidly going to approach the carbon-14 content of the bone itself. So the only way that you can get that is to have the entire organism migrate in, take all of its carbon-14 from the outside. Remember the outside, you have to have 25% of the weight of the, of the carbon in the bone coming in either by way of microbes or by way of uh, attracting chemicals from the outside that have carbon-14 in them. Fluorescence microscopy, DNA uh, extraction, and 16S gene amplica uh, amplicon sequencing. DNA concentration was about 50 times higher in the subterranean centrosaurus bone than in the adjacent mudstone matrix. The adjacent mudstone matrix contained amino acids that seemed to largely represent dead prokaryote remains, unlike the amino acids in the dinosaur bone that seemed to largely represent a more recent likely living community in comparison. Notice again, no mention of cultures. The 16S uh, ribosome RNA gene amplicon sequencing revealed the predominance of acino actinobacteria and proteobacteria in subterranean centrosaurus bone. These results suggested that the subterranean dinosaur bone contained a different microbial community than the surrounding mudstone matrix because it had different uh, organisms, a ribosomal RNA in it. Our initial sequence data furthermore suggests that some of these microbes might represent rare, poorly understood taxa. In other words, there's some stuff in there. They don't really know what it is. Discussion. Evidence for recent exogenous organic material in dinosaur bones. Structure and elemental composition. Occasional infilling reserved, uh, observed in the hydrochloric acid demineralized dinosaur bone vessels with greater carbon concentrations in the interior compared with the exterior of the vessel is consistent with a growing biofilm given the assumption that a biofilm would grow inside the porous spaces of the bone while preserved vessels might be expected to be hollow. So again, this is assuming that it's consistent with it. It might be consistent with original material. You don't know. This uh, silicon dominance of the hydrochloric acid demineralization products from the dinosaur bone likely suggests that they're at least partially silicified, which we've known for some time. A hydrochloric acid demineralization, especially the relatively intensive demineralization used on the samples that under, underwent microscopy, EDS and ATR, FI, FTIR, may favor mineralized biofilm retrieval, assuming that low pH might degrade organically preserved biofilms, explaining why all the observed demineralization products of the dinosaur bone have high silicon content under EDS especially in comparison to the presumably largely organic vessels and fibrous masses revealed using EDTA uh, demineralization. If you can demineralize it with hydrochloric acid, you can demineralize it with EDTA, and the EDTA uh, apparently uh, allows you to see apparently largely organic vessels and fibrous masses. And they have a picture of an organic uh, vessel and a fibrous mass in the, in the paper. 
pyrolysis product, amino acids, the dominance of L amino acids in the dinosaur fossils suggests significant leaching and degradation of endogenous amino acids as well as relatively recent amino acid input. There appears to be a trend toward greater concentration of amino acid in the dinosaur bone compared to the mudstone, suggesting that the fossil bone might be preferentially concentrated in exogenous amino acids. Skipping over radiocarbon as the Carbon in the dinosaur bone is not radiocarbon dead. This suggests an influx of more modern carbon, that is, not radiocarbon dead, into the fossil. However, lower uh, fraction modern 14 of carbon in the dinosaur bone, compared to the mudstone or topsoil, suggests some biologically inaccessible old and possibly endogenous carbon within the fossils. Of course, it could suggest that maybe it's not as old as they think, but one possibility for this pattern is kerogen derived from in situ polymerization of endogenous dinosaur label lipids, although this type of aliphatic geopolymer has only been weakly detected in centrosaurus bones through uh, pyrolysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, potentially due to methodology then, rather than low concentration, and it should be kept in mind that the surrounding mudstone matrix yields a series of N-alkanes or N-alkenes after pyrolysis. Endogenous carbon could also become metabolically inaccessible in bone through biofilm mineralization as suggested by the EDS data, allowing for carbon-14 depletion. Additionally, biofilm just simply not moving would do the job quite nicely, thank you. Additionally, biofilm formation and proliferation in bones could trap mobile organic carbon from sediment and groundwater at a rate faster than carbon exists in the bone when not colonized by a biofilm. This would allow for a lower uh, fraction modern carbon-14 steady state to be reached during the time it takes carbon outflux to increase in order to match carbon influx assuming a simple one-box model. Perhaps a combination of these three mechanisms influences uh, fraction modern 14 of carbon. Actually, if you think about it, it's really difficult to visualize how you, how you get that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Nucleic acids. Analysis of nucleic acids reveals a diverse, unusual microbial community within the dinosaur bone, even when compared to the immediate mudstone matrix or the exterior surface of the bone as evidenced by a strong enrichment in DNA and differing community composition in the bone relative to the surrounding matrix. So they're finding DNA in this bone. They're finding it, it's different from what's outside the bone. So I guess evolution must happen really fast in order to make this work. Um, lack of evidence for ancient endogenous proteins in dinosaur bones. Structure and elemental composition. Uh, skip over that, uh, IR active bone bonds, uh, which is another heading, pyrolysis product. Regardless, the presence of protein-related hydrolysis pyrolysis products does not indicate that these proteins are necessarily ancient, endogenous, or collagenous. And again, if they tie, we win. Amino acids. Amino acids in the dinosaur bone are dominated by proteins other than collagen. Notice it doesn't say there aren't collagen proteins. It just says that it's dominated by other proteins and appear to be relatively recent. And you see, if you know the bones are old, well, you know that those proteins can't possibly be original. Conclusions. Previous studies have often reported pur purported endogenous soft tissues within fossil dinosaur bones. We've seen these references before. However, these studies do not often do not fully address fossil bones being open systems that are biologically active. This can be seen in field observations in Dinosaur Provincial Park and elsewhere where fossil bone is frequently colonized by lichen on the surface or overgrown and penetrated by plant roots in the subsurface. This forces researchers to consider that subsurface biota, plant roots, fungi, animals, protists, and bacteria could contaminate bone. Given that fungi can produce collagen, that's an interesting reference. The need to rule out exogenous sources of organics in fossil bones is made all the greater. 
Even deeply buried bone has the potential to be biologically active, given the high concentration of microorganisms in con continental subsurface sedimentary rock. The analysis presented here are consistent with the idea that far from being biologically dead, fossil bone supports a diverse, active, and specialized microbial community. Given this, it is necessary to rule out the hypothesis of subsurface contamination before concluding that fossil preserve geochemically unstable endogenous organics like proteins. So in other words, you really need to rule out their hypothesis before you can assume that they're un uh, unstable endogenous organics like proteins. Because if it's really that way, then how can it be that old? And we all know that it has to be that old. We detected no evidence of endogenous proteins in the bone studies here and were therefore unable to replicate claims of protein survival from deep time such as the Mesozoic. In contrast, recent Pleistocene-Holocene material often shows clear and multiple lines of evidence for endogenous ancient collagen. These may be found even when the fossil, dentine enamel in this case, is stained black and indicates taphonomic alteration and this sample is found exhumed in a warm climate and not treated with aseptic techniques. Uh, shark teeth from Florida, fossil shark teeth. Recently, it has been suggested that techniques do not provide information on the precise sequence or post-translational modification, um, uh, modifications of peptides such as the two that they're using, two of them that they're using, are outdated for paleoproteinomic studies. This might be the case when samples are very young and from cold environments, in which case more precise mass spectrometry spectrometric analysis such as liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry might be employed early on in the course of research with elevated confidence that ancient proteins are capable of persisting in the sample. But don't you dare try it on these old bones. However, our results here suggest that techniques like uh, the two that were mentioned, HPLC and uh, uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, that give more general information on protein presence versus absence or general amino acid composition should be considered frontline approaches when dealing with samples of significant age and or thermal maturity. Treating Mesozoic bone that has experienced diagenesis, low latitudes, and permineralization, of course low latitudes, uh, Montana is not exactly low latitude, but whatever, um, and permineralization identically to more recent less altered bone is ill-advised and any work on such samples should employ these fundamental methods before attempting to sequence peptides that might not be present ancient or endogenous. So don't even try those fancy ones. Mary Schweitzer, are you listening? Fossil bone has fairly high concentrations of recent organic. The, for example, L-amino acids, DNA, and non-radiocarbon dead organic carbon. Even when buried and often in comparison to the immediate environment, fossil bone likely provides an ideal nutrient-rich phosphate iron open system microbial habitat inside vascular canals capable of moisture retention. The absence of evidence for endogenous proteins and the presence of a diverse microbial community urge caution regarding claims of dinosaur bone soft tissues. Microbes can colonize bones while buried, likely traveling via groundwater. Therefore, it is unsurprising that the prevalence of these fossil, these soft tissues is not correlated with overburdened depth above the fossil or cortical versus cancellous bone tissue. Rather, minimum distance from the surface is probably of importance and microbes likely readily colonize a variety of bone tissue types since both presumably behave as open systems. Our results support the hypothesis that at least some soft tissue structures derived from demineralized fossil bones represent biofilms. We suggest that unless in an inaccessible form, for example, keratin, depending on microbic, microbial metabolic activity, or matrix, a well-cemented concretion, Endogenous dinosaur organics that survive prior tap taphonomic process, for example, diagenesis, may be subject to subsequent microbial metabolic recycling. So the, the bugs are in there, they're growing. The fossil 
the study of fossil organics must be must consider potential microbial present presence through a specimen's taphonomic history from early to late. Microbial communities interact with fossils immediately following death. Whoa, wait a minute. Immediately following death and after burial, but prior to diagenesis. If it was immediately after death and it was 65 million years, then the amino acid dating would fall apart. So would the um, carbon-14. Think about that. It can't be immediately after death. It has to be recent. Or maybe it was immediately after death and it is also recent, but that's, uh, we're not going there right now, right? Um, <clears throat> Hmm. Microbial microbes are known to utilize bone and tooth proteins, and fossil evidence of early fungal colonization has even been detected. More, oh, we can detect fungal colonization, which could produce collagen-like material, according to this. And and by the way, they're partly right on that. There is a collagen-like material. Uh, it's worth reading. It's only in certain parts of the fungus. More recent microbial colonization of fossil bone will occur as it nears the surface during uplift and erosion in the late stages of taphonomic process. Taphonomic, meaning burial. Furthermore, given that microbes can inhabit the crust kilometers below the surface, it might be predicted that bone remains a biologically active habitat even when buried hundreds of meters deep for millions of years. The extensive potential for microbial contamination and metabolic consumption makes verifying claims of Mesozoic bone protein extremely challenging. Now, my take on all that, it's an interesting report. I think it does strongly suggest that the material inside of dinosaur bone that was studied in this case is recent. I think they're right. Amino acid racemization and carbon-14, hard to argue that those aren't millions of years old. It is less convincing uh, that what was seen was microbial. For one thing, there's no microbial or fungal structures. You kind of expect that. Um, you know, microbes don't self-destruct in five seconds. Um, and, and there's no growth that was reported. They did all this sterile stuff. What were they doing the sterile stuff for? The sterile stuff doesn't matter unless you're trying to avoid growing organisms in there that weren't there to begin with. And if you're keeping it refrigerated, they're not going to grow very fast. I think that the proposed mechanism is inadequate. The researchers do not explain how carbon-14 can get into the bone in sufficient amounts. Remember last week's study suggesting that in most cases, carbon dioxide cannot be incorporated into bacteria. There are a few of them that do, but they get an energy source from elsewhere. And inside the bone, there is no energy source that isn't already you know, just breaking down organic compounds. In which case, why not just use leftover organic compounds for your carbon? It's a lot harder to make carbon dioxide out of carbon. It takes design. And it takes a design that's not going to happen in the bone. That means that 25% of the carbon must have come from the outside, not as carbon dioxide, but as organic carbon. Amino acids, sugars, fats, something. And this has to happen in the last 5,730 years or else you've decayed half of it away. Actually, probably in the last 1,000 years, you know, because the longer you wait, the more decay you get. Um, and th then the requirement for carbon doubles, so then you have to replace it with, um, instead of a quarter, you have to replace half of it. And if it's 12,000 years, uh, 11,000 something years, uh, you've got uh, now you have to replace it all 
It can't be more than 11,000 years, period. And yet, either something started the bacteria then, which why 5,000 years ago all of a sudden the bacteria started to grow is kind of an interesting question. Or they've been merely churning up the bone for literally millions of years. If you're assuming something that's been constant, it's been chewing, there should be nothing left. You should not see those structures that they found too, by the way. This does not seem to me to be a likely hypothesis. A similar argument can be made for amino acid racemization. It has to be recent bacterial activity, um, but then why hasn't it been growing since the, the bones were buried? And why is there anything left to support life at all now? Finally, remember that when the carbon-14 data from the paleo group were alleged to be erroneous and their paper was made to disappear. Anybody remember that? This is the missing presentation, the presentation that just disappeared. This paper got carbon-14 data in the same range, which means that the problem with the paleo group uh, presentation was not the data. It was that they did not have an explanation consistent with the standard ge geologic time scale. In other words, it wasn't the data, it was the conclusion. That's one conclusion you cannot make. I predict that this problem will become more acute with time. But that's my opinion. <laughs> now it's your turn. Uh, comment here and then here. Go ahead, Ariel. Yeah, I'm just uh, interested. Schwarzer's antibody tests seem to have been ignored, or what goes on here? Uh, it could be a false positive. Therefore, if it needs to be a false positive, it is a false positive. And so now you can ignore her data. It can't okay. be there, and everybody knows it. And so if she's seeing stuff, she's seeing things. The theory is so strong, the data doesn't matter anymore. Welcome to politics. One of the best professors I ever had was a statistician. And I've been hearing him turn over in his grave over and over again during your presentation. Because basically what they're saying is, unless you can prove I'm right, don't start your experiment. Unless you can prove I'm wrong. No, they unless expect to be accepted as right. Unless you can prove they're wrong. You know, you can't try to prove them wrong unless you start with the assumption they're right. That The way they use no hypothesis so it's, is, it's is even, meaningless it's in even worse statistics. Than, yeah, I, I agree with you. I I think that, that, that it wouldn't matter, uh, you know, if you were w walk up to them and have a perfect... Yeah. I mean, in statistics, the failure to reject a null hypothesis does not say, therefore, if you didn't reject it, the null hypothesis is true. The statistics are irrelevant unless they can reject it. That is true. And so that's why I paraphrase it to say, unless you can prove I'm right, don't start because you won't be able to. If you reject my hypothesis, it's meaningless. Well, they're stuck in between a rock and a hard place. There's all this evidence for this dinosaur stuff. There's all this evidence that it can't last that long. And it can't be recent, and so something's got to give. And Precisely. you know that say, being recent is not going to give, so now it's an argument between it can't be there and it is there. Yeah, I mean, that's a way I'm trying to paraphrase it was unless you accept that I'm saying it can't be young. Yeah. Don't start trying to show it yeah. might be young. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and the thing that amazes me is that this is now the third carbon-14 date that's in the published literature deliberately says there's carbon-14 in this, some of this material. And nobody has a word of apology to the paleo group who did this way back when, to 2012, tried to publish it, well actually presented it in 2012, and then the presentation was made to disappear off of the AGS uh, AA, see, AOGU website. The, the, the paper is gone. The only way you know it was there is because you can count and it goes from presentation one, two, three, four, six, seven, and eight. And five is just down the memory hole. And nobody's apologized to them. Look, we disagree with your conclusions, but your data actually is pretty good. So therefore, why did you bother? I, I guess if you can come away with one thing, you can come away with the idea that these people are not objective about one central fact, or what they want to consider a fact anyway, that is the linchpin of everything they're doing and you can question everything else but you cannot question that one fact, no matter what the evidence is. And the evidence is stacking up. Well, I would say, yes. I'll, I'll just... Uh indicate here uh, this is interesting from a different standpoint that is uh, so often in the fossil record you find a fossil a microscopic fossil and you say okay that's the same age as the rocks around it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this tends to open this door a little wider which uh, I've been hollering about for years that uh, Hey, these is the water goes up and down through all these sediments, and the bacteria go up and down through these sediments. And if you find uh, an organism way down, you have no idea how recent it is, especially if it's alive. Uh, 600 feet down in the sediments, uh, and it's a uh, photosynthetic organism that needs light, and it's still alive. Uh, you have a hard time saying, "Hey, that's not a recent content. That's a, that's not <laughs> hasn't been there as long as uh, those layers claim this is a recent contamination." And and uh, it's uh, a lot of the argument in the uh, about biofilms and other things in the Precambrian stuff is subject to reevaluation because. You don't know when those organisms, those microorganisms, got there. And it's uh, a, it's a whole. It, it raises huge questions about uranium. It's series. a question that's never raised in the literature. Well, you see, if you get the answer that you expect, you stop there. You don't ask further questions because it feels good. If, on the other hand, you have, you have data that really doesn't fit. That's what you work on, because you need to get it in, fit into your paradigm. If it doesn't fit, then you keep working on it until it does. And, and then you see, you see there are two classes of, of problems, ones that we have solved and ones that we're working on. Neither one of which disproves our major premise. It's a nice way of making your major premise 
completely uh, independent of the facts. And we need to be careful to not make the same mistakes. That's exactly right. We have to be very careful not to make the same. Well, depending on how much time I have, we'll either talk about the uh, Ellen White stuff or we'll be talking about the, uh, uh, there's another um, article that just came out and that, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it says now. That's bad. Um, that uh, it just just came out recently that uh, uh, may be a little easier to do when I'm working um, every day, but except for Christmas. <laughs> anyway, come back. We'll have something for you next week. <laughs>